The new guardian's out. Hello, welcome to SF Live. I'm your host, Christina Marie Flores. Well, as executive editor of the SF Bay Guardian, our guest tonight holds one of the most important jobs in the voice of progressive opinion in San Francisco. Please help me welcome Tim Redman. Hi, Tim. Thanks, Christina. Happy to be on your show. Great, great. So, Tim, let me tell you, I love the picture on the front, by the way. This is our <laughs> latest one. This is an actual uh, position, I think. I've seen him in this position many times, like... <laughs> Talk to the hand, baby. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So let's learn a little bit about you. Where are you from originally? I grew up in North Tarrytown, New York, a, uh, a suburb about 20 miles north of New York City. Mm -hmm. Mostly a suburb. It was. Uh, it's in Westchester County, which at that time and still now is a very wealthy suburb of New York City with a lot mm -hmm. of commuters. But North Tarrytown was different. This was a town where about half the people lived in families where, you know, um, mommy stayed at home with the kids and daddy got up in the morning and took the train to New York mm -hmm. and worked in an office building in New York and came home at night. And about half the people came from families where either the mom or the dad worked in the assembly line at the General Motors plant in town because General Motors had the largest um, East Coast and one of the largest North American assembly plants in North Tarrytown. So it was a, um, a city for or a town for Westchester County that was actually had some diversity. We actually had African-American kids at the high school and we had Latino kids and there were immigrants from all over the world really because of the unionized jobs in the, the assembly plant. And they were all living in the same quality houses? Well, you same... know, to a remarkable extent. I mean, mm -hmm. there were some poorer sections of town and some richer sections of town. But the remarkable thing was the neighborhood I grew up in, which was your basic post-war housing development, middle-class housing development, mm -hmm. we had you know, doctors and we had lawyers and my father worked in New York and uh, the guy next to me was the producer of Hee Haw, a uh, television <laughs> show. I love that show. <laughs> John Ellsworth lived That's next door exact. to me. And, you know, we also had plumbers mm -hmm. and people whose parents worked at the General Motors plant and you really couldn't tell the difference between people's lifestyles. I mean, you know, everyone had a new car every three or four years and people took vacations and it, it wasn't like the doctors and lawyers and executives in New York seemed that phenomenally richer than the unionized workers at the General Motors plant. And, you know, I, I always look back on that. It's like, in those days, the United Auto Workers brought um, assembly line workers up to the middle class to the point where they really could live a middle class life just and and the tax structure and the structure of wealth in this society was such that the wealthier people weren't that much richer so you know I and I always look back on that as a period of relative socio or relative economic equality in mm -hmm. the United States and there's a lot of factors in that and as I say I think two of the main ones were the power of the union movement and the tax laws and the, the way that wealth was structured in the society. And, you know, of course, in those days, we had nowhere near the um, gender equality, no, nowhere near the racial equality. In those days, you know, God, uh, for a, a high school kid to be openly gay was a terrifying prospect. And we have come so far on those fronts, mm -hmm. you know, particularly in a city like San Francisco. I look around now and, and you know, um, as you well know, young queer kids are... are out and accepted and a part of society and we have a black president and we have come so far in gender equality not all the way but we've come a long ways and at the same time I look back in the town I grew up in and I realize we've gone completely backwards mm -hmm. on socioeconomic equality this is now one of the most socially stratified countries in the industrialized world the gap between the rich and the poor as we have come so far in these other social movements that we worked so hard for in the 60s the difference between the rich and the poor has gone dramatically the other way mm -hmm. And that's really a lot of what drives my journalism and my politics. That now, were you were your family were they politically active? Was your kid? Did oh, they have my, that at the dinner my, table. Were my you family was always politically active. Interestingly, okay. at that time, my parents were both Republicans, mm -hmm. but they were more um, Nelson Rockefeller Republicans, not Ronald Reagan Republicans. And the difference is, they were much more socially liberal, mm -hmm. and um, and not, you know these radical right-wingers that we see these days as, as the part of the Republican Party. But, um, you know, as the Republican Party moved away from them, they moved away from the Republican Party, and, um, and you know, neither of them voted for Ronald Reagan. And, in fact, interestingly, um, my mom went back to work after my father started having problems with his business. My mom went back to work to support the family and ended up in her 50s and 60s becoming a union organizer. Oh, really? And she organized a union at the uh, community college she worked at in Westchester County, started it herself, um, built uh, against huge management opposition, built a very successful union in that place and is still there today. And um, she's now retired. Um, but uh, so, yeah, my family was always active in politics. Uh -huh. And we talked about politics at the dinner table. And, you know, the thing my parents always taught me is don't be quiet. 
Don't just, whatever it is you believe in, and we didn't always agree, but with AI, I said, don't, whatever it is you believe in, speak up. And, you know, as a, a high school kid, I went to school board meetings and I, I spoke up on issues. And, and so I, I grew up in an active family. You know what, mom and dad, you did a really good job because he's talking, talking, talking. It's great. Now, were you on the school paper? When you were in the school? I was on the school paper when I was in college. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, that's that was really my start in journalism. I, uh, I got on the school, school paper kind of by accident just because, you know, your first year in college, you know, you, as you're not often on in a social circumstance with people who you've chosen, you don't know. And I, you know, the people on my hall my first year were really kind of pre-professional types. And, and um, I wasn't getting along really well with them. So I just walked in the newspaper office one day and said, hey, um, is there anything to do here? Figuring it would be a good place to meet people, uh -huh. which it was. And um, and over the years, over my tenure there, we kind of transformed the paper from a fairly staid, traditional campus newspaper to a real activist paper. <laughs> that, that it really went out there and tried to stir up some trouble on campus. And was that because of your influence? I was one of those who had that influence. You were an instigator? <laughs> I was an instigator. Go figure. I always say, you know, when I was a junior in college, the commies took over the paper. But really, it was, it was less any political ideology than the idea that a newspaper should be an activist force in its community. Mm -hmm. That it's not enough to stand there and say, the president held a press conference today and announced that three more programs are being cut at Wesleyan. We'd, we'd go out there and say, why and what and how can we stop this? As mm -hmm. opposed to just saying, this is what's happening. Our attitude was, you can't just take this. We have to encourage the students to be active, encourage people to go out and say, the situation is not okay. Mm -hmm. And we can do something about it. And um, I realized that as a, a small, twice a week newspaper on a college campus with 3,000 people, we were able to stir up a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. In those days, the big issue was uh, apartheid and um, college campuses investing in companies that did business in South Africa. Mm. So we managed to get a copy of the university's investment portfolio, and we did a big front page story, and pretty soon a whole bunch of people took over the president's office, and CBS News was there, and it was a big deal, <laughs> and I thought, you know, we've instigated this, and, and we should have. So I, I've always been an activist journalist. Mm -hmm. And when you get a taste of that as a student, that you can make that movement and get people inspired, it must be very addictive. Well, you know, I went to work after I got out of college for a while for the Hartford Current mm -hmm. in Hartford, Connecticut. And that was a very traditional, mainstream newspaper. And after a few months, I went to the state editor, who was a very nice kind of professorial guy, and I said, uh, Claude, how come we don't write about the insurance industry? Yeah. We're here in Hartford, Connecticut. And he said, oh, we, we do that on the business pages. And I said, Claude, I saw yesterday two more middle-aged white guys got promoted to executive vice president of Aetna. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, why don't we talk about where the rates go? And all the big insurance companies are here. Aren't they colluding? These guys must go to the same clubs at night. There's antitrust stuff. There's... And he said, Tim, <laughs> you'll be a great reporter someday, but you need to learn to be more objective. So after they fired you from there, where did you go? <laughs> I didn't. I, I, I left. I, I, I said, this really isn't for me. So I moved to San Francisco instead of being more objective. Uh-huh. And I wound up writing for the Bay Guardian because the Bay Guardian shared my vision of what a newspaper can be. Mm -hmm. You know, our, our motto is it's a newspaper's duty to print the news and raise hell. And that's what we try to do. We, we take stands on issues. I would argue that no newspaper is objective. No journalism is objective. It's all about what you decide to cover and mm -hmm. what you don't cover. Right. It's not just about the way you slant articles, but what articles never make it into the paper. Mm -hmm. And we try to cover the city from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, we take a stand on issues. We say some things are okay and some things are not okay. This is one of, despite the recession, this is one of the richest cities in America, one of the richest cities in the world. There are, at last count, I think 11 billionaires living in San Francisco. Wow. And we have 8,000 homeless people on yeah, the streets. That's, that's not okay. No. That is not okay. That is a level of social inequality that is not acceptable in an American city. Mm -hmm. And when I cover stories about homelessness in the Bay Guardian, I don't cover them from the point of view of, oh, it's just one of those things. Homelessness is here. As Willie Brown said, it's a problem that will never be solved. I look at this and say, how in one of the wealthiest cities that has ever existed in human civilization, how can it be that we're allowing this situation to occur? So we look for solutions. So when did this chasm, I mean, this whole that's separating the haves from the have-nots, when did this start? When can you trace that back? Because I grew up in the city, and I remember it used to be pretty much across the board. I mean, I went to school with people whose fathers and mothers did all sorts of things. It was much more united. Then it started pulling apart. Can we trace that back? Yeah, we to... can. Two things, Prop 13 and Ronald Reagan. Um, in fact, yeah, when you went to school here, there weren't homeless people all over. No, not at all. No. Not at all. Um, what happened was... After Prop 13 